Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Pathagonia. So today, I'm gonna talk a little bit about inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, so I was curious before recording this episode, I was wondering just how many people worldwide inflammatory bowel disease affects. And just a quick Google search uh, pointed out that roughly 10 million humans uh, have and deal with uh, inflammatory bowel disease. So in quite incredibly common uh, disease and something important to know for pathology residents and uh, just humans in general, something to be aware of. So we'll start out. So we have our talk a little bit about normal colon. So in normal colon, the crypts should be oriented parallel to one another, uh, classically referred to as test tubes in a rack. So whenever the crypts uh, differ or vary from this test tube parallel orientation, um, that's when you're worried about uh, some architectural distortion, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on. But typically those test tubes in a rack come down to uh, rest on the muscularis mucosa layer in the colon. So there can be some variation um, histologically on what you'll see in the colon. So in the right colon or in the ascending colon, you'll typically see more lymphocytes, uh, panath cells, and less goblet cells. And if you just think about that logically, that makes sense, right? Because goblet cells we associate with mucin, which is going to prepare the uh, feces to exit out of like the rectum and the anus, which is more going to be later on in the colonic tract, uh, more towards the left side, um, where you would see more goblet cells. And then also, if you think about the panath cells, uh, I was reading a little bit about those, and those are typically associated with the production of antimicrobial peptides and immunity. So I always associate the appendix, which is on the right side uh, near the cecum, um, ileocecal valve, you have your appendix, which also can be um, believed to be involved with immunity. So I just think panath cells, immunity, more common on the right, and then lymphocytes, obviously we associate with immunity as well, and they're more common on the right. So in the left colon, you're gonna have less lymphocytes, and it's more abnormal to see panath cells, but you are gonna have more goblet cells because you're preparing that uh, digestive tract or the colon for feces to go through and be excreted from the body. So you're gonna need more mucus production and more goblet cells on the left side. So some architectural distortion and mucophages in the rectum are considered normal. And intraepithelial lymphocytes and even rare neutrophils over top of the lymphoid follicles that you'll see throughout the colon is also considered normal. So we'll just go over some patterns of damage that you can see in inflammatory bowel disease. So the inflammation in inflammatory bowel disease is characterized by the presence or absence of activity. And activity is defined as neutrophilic inflammation of the epithelium with epithelial damage and chronicity, uh, which includes architectural distortion, a basal lymphoplasmocytosis, which is when you have those crypts lifting off that muscularis layer, and also panath cell metaplasia is a feature of chronicity. So these words are combined such that you can have an active colitis, a chronic active colitis, or a chronic inactive colitis, which is also sometimes called quiescent colitis. And just timeline-wise, if you have a new onset untreated inflammatory bowel disease, that's typically going to be an active colitis. You're going to see more neutrophils, and that activity, uh, again, is associated with PMNs or neutrophils. Um, you can see cryptitis, which is when you have neutrophils within the epithelium of the crypts, or you can have crypt abscesses, which is when neutrophils fill the lumen of those crypts. So you're forming a little abscess in the lumen or just cryptitis. Either of those are going to get you at least having active in the name. And approximately around one month of untreated active colitis is then going to transfer or transform into chronic active colitis. And how do we get to chronic? Well, we need to see signs of chronicity, which in the colon, signs of chronicity include crypt or architectural distortion. So we no longer have those perfect test tubes in a rack. 
We may have this abnormal appearance of the test tubes or the crypts, which can involve crypt shortening, crypt branching, crypt dropout, uh, loss of crypt parallelism, uh, villiform surface, and that basal lymphoplasmocytosis, which if you imagine this to be the muscularis mucosa layer, the, these crypts here, these two, are lifted up off that layer. So that crypt lift off is uh, that basal lymphoplasmocytosis. And also you can see a lot of plasma cells in the lamina propria, panath cell metaplasia, and pyloric gland metaplasia. Those are all features of chronicity. So if you have chronic active colitis and they undergo treatment, individuals with inflammatory bowel disease can be in remission. And in that case, you may see chronic inactive colitis or quiescent colitis. So inflammatory bowel disease is really subclassified as either ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. So the umbrella term is IBD. However, it can be broken down based on what you see under the microscope and uh, what is seen clinically. So ulcerative colitis, you're gonna see chronic active inflammation in the rectum, and that's gonna proceed proximally in continuous diffuse pattern. And the typical findings histologically are gonna be chronic active colitis. So we're gonna see neutrophils, we're gonna see features of chronicity like architectural distortion or pyloric gland metaplasia. Um, and the chronic active colitis is limited to the mucosa and a superficial submucosa with ulceration. You can see deeper inflammation with severe fulminant colitis and you can have increased inflammation in the cecum near the appendiceal orifice or the cecal patch. You can also have inflammation in the terminal ileum known as backwash ileitis. And moving on, so let's talk a little bit about Crohn's disease. So Crohn's disease, you're gonna have patchy transmural chronic active inflammation in any part of the GI tract. And you can contrast that with what we just talked about with ulcerative colitis. So Crohn's disease, you have patchy involvement rather than diffuse and continuous involvement of, of ulcerative colitis. So the typical findings in Crohn's include transmural inflammation, there's skip areas and patchy inflammation, and classically you can see those granulomas. So you can also see granulomas in ulcerative colitis, like crypt rupture granulomas, however, as far as IBD is concerned, under the microscope, granulomas are more classically associated with Crohn's disease. Uh, and you can have ulcers or superficial aphthys to fissuring, um, muscle and nerve hypertrophy, pyloric gland metaplasia, um, fibrosis and strictures, and fistulas. And you can also have an entity known as indeterminate colitis, or IBD type unclassified. So approximately 10% of patients are unclassifiable, often due to the extensive pathologic and clinical overlap between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. So that's why we have this placeholder term. Uh, this is not a specific entity. Um, it's often due to insufficient data or fulminant colitis. And the differential diagnosis for inflammatory bowel disease includes active colitis, also known as acute self-limited colitis. And I actually did a presentation on this after my GI rotation. I went through Dr. Laura Lamp's book on various infectious diseases of the GI tract. And a lot of them, like as is mentioned here, E. coli, Salmonella, Shigella, Cap Campylobacter, and various viruses, can cause this acute self-limiting colitis, which can be very difficult to distinguish from inflammatory bowel disease. So when that is the case, we're often gonna to have to rely on our microbiology laboratory and other tests to distinguish um, if it is inflammatory bowel disease or if we're dealing with an infectious process. So in active colitis, you're gonna, as the name would suggest, you're gonna have neutrophilic cryptitis but chronicity is absent. So you're not having those architectural changes or crypt distortions. Um, you can have neutrophils in the superficial lamina propria, crypt abscesses, hemorrhage, edema, and possible erosions. 
So E. coli 0157H7 classically causes ischemic changes and active colitis looks similar um, to what can be caused by some medications such as NSAIDs and checkpoint inhibitors um, or new onset inflammatory bowel disease can look a lot like active colitis. Moving on, so also on the differential for IBD, you can have focal active colitis, which is similar to what we just talked about, right, with active colitis, but it's just going to occur focally. So you can have focal neutrophilic cryptitis and the absence of chronicity, again, because this is an active colitis, not a chronic active colitis. And some of the causes of focal active colitis are NSAIDs, um, where you'll get increased apoptoses and ischemic-like changes, bowel preparation artifact, where you'll have increased apoptoses, edema, and mucin depletion, um, early infection, so day zero to four after onset, or ischemic changes can look a lot like or cause focal active colitis, which is often with lamina propria, hyalinization, and crypt withering. Uh, also on the differential diagnosis, for IBD, you have microscopic colitis. So microscopic colitis can be broken down into lymphocytic colitis and collagenous colitis. Um, so in both entities, you're gonna have increased intraepithelial lymphocytes or IELs, and neutrophils are rare to absent. So in lymphocytic colitis, the intraepithelial lymphocytes are gonna be greater than or equal to 20 per 100 surface epithelial cells. You're going to have normal architecture and then chronic inflammation in the lamina propria. Uh, contrast that with collagenous colitis, which you're going to have more than 10 to 20 uh, intraepithelial lymphocytes per surface, per 100 surface epithelial cells, and increased subepithelial collagen, which entraps capillaries and lymphocytes and is highlighted by the trichrome stain. So collagenous colitis classically has like a thin layer of collagen um, that sometimes is referred to as wax dripping on a candle. And it stands out the first time you see a case of it, it uh, you'll definitely be able to recognize it moving forward. And to differentiate lymphocytic and collagenous, you're going to have that collagenous band um, and collagenous, obviously. And then you're just going to have more lymphocytes um, and lymphocytic colitis. Uh, Clinical, clinically, this may just be, maybe they'll give a case of an older lady with diarrhea and then they do a colonoscopy and they're not really seeing anything, so they just take random samples and then those samples wind up on your desk and you look under the microscope and you see either that increased subepithelial collagen or increased intraepithelial lymphocytes and then you make the diagnosis of microscopic colitis. So some additional entities on the differential for inflammatory bowel disease include ischemic colitis, which will have a hyalinized lamina propria, withered crypts, and minimal inflammation. Radiation-induced colitis, you'll have those ischemic changes, atypical stromal cells, and telangiectatic blood vessels. And then diverticular disease-associated colitis, which in the colonic segment with diverticulosis. In diversion colitis, this is gonna be caused by perhaps after a procedure where the colon has been isolated from the fecal stream and there's gonna be follicular lymphoid hyperplasia. In prolapse, you're gonna have fibromuscular hyperplasia and then classically, you're gonna have those angulated diamond-shaped crypts. Uh, you could have a vasculitis, which is just inflammatory destruction of vessels and fibr fibrinoid necrosis and then eosinophilic or allergic colitis, where you'll have more than 60 eosinophils per 10 high-powered fields, few neutrophils, and the absence of chronicity. Um, there are some STDs that can cause STD proctitis, often chlamydia or syphilis, due to anal receptive intercourse, and there's gonna be lots of ulceration, plasma cells, and histiocytes, and it's gonna be confined typically to the rectum. So for medical management of inflammatory bowel disease, you usually have two phases, induction and maintenance. And this used to involve a step-up therapy. So patients were started on a more mild drug and then moved to a more powerful drug 
if they failed the more mild one. However, recent clinical trials have shown better complication-free survival with a top-down model, where you start with a more powerful medication, such as a monoclonal antibody. And I'm not going to read all of them off, but here are some of the medications to be aware of. And then here's our list of monoclonal antibodies. So typically, patients um, respond better and have a better outcome if they're started on a more aggressive therapy like a monoclonal antibody first rather than working their way up to uh, such treatments. So there is uh, approximately a two time greater risk of cancer in uh, individuals with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, which is why um, starting out with a stronger, more effective treatment is better, right? So if we stay on top of it, then it's less likely that um, these individuals will have inflammation, which will lead to less DNA oxidation and damage and a less lower likelihood of cancer. So the risk is proportional to the severity and the duration of inflammation. So as I mentioned, if you use these monoclonal antibody treatments earlier on, you're gonna have a less severe disease and a less uh, likelihood of developing something serious or allowing that disease to progress to cancer down the road. And the screening recommendations do change um, for individuals with IBD. So in the first eight to 10 years of diagnosis, there's no real increase in screening, um, particularly for cancer, because there's not really enough time for carcinogenesis to occur. And in 10 to 20 years after diagnosis, you're gonna get screened every one to three years. And if you've had IBD for 20 or more years, you're probably gonna have screening every year or two. So if di dysplasia does develop in inflammatory bowel disease, it can be treated. So with modern techniques, including high definition and chromo endoscopy, most dysplasia is visible. As such, it can be completely resected endoscopically. So once a dysplastic lesion has been resected in the absence of surrounding dysplasia, ongoing meticulous colonoscopic surveillance is appropriate and proctocolectomy or surgery, so cutting out that segment of bowel, is only recommended for dysplasia if endoscopic resection is not possible or if non-visible high-grade dysplasia or adenocarcinoma is found. So let's just go over some of this dysplasia that can occur. Um, that's our role as a pathologist, right? We're looking for dysplasia, which can be a precursor to um, like an invasive cancer. Um, so it's all about the nucleus and assessing nuclear detail and seeing where um, the the patient's tissue and where their cells are uh, on that spectrum of benign, uh, starting to become dysplastic, and then an invasive malignant process. So generally it follows a stepwise, stepwise progression that I just kind of talked about. So non-neoplastic, benign, um, to low-grade dysplasia, high-grade dysplasia, and then adenocarcinoma. However, there are cases where it appears to go directly from low grade or even normal to adenocarcinoma very quickly or directly. So conventional dysplasia looks like your usual adenoma, which we'll get to here with low grade dysplasia, but there are some entities that can be known as indefinite for dysplasia. So that's when you're unable to classify as definitively reactive or dysplastic um, often it's atypia in a, in a setting of severe inflammation or ulceration. Um, so if you have some, an image, something like this, you look under the microscope, you can see that these nuclei don't look totally normal, right? They're starting to elongate, they look a little hyperchromatic. They don't look totally benign, but there is a lot of inflammation, right? A lot of neutrophils involved in this crypt. So. Perhaps this is just a reactive process, but we're not sure, right? We, we don't wanna just chalk it up to being reactive if it is an early dysplastic process. So that's where you'd have something like indefinite for dysplasia to uh, fall back on. All right.
right, moving on. So you can have low grade dysplasia, and this looks like a sporadic adenoma. Um, so it's gonna be enlarged, hyperchromatic, smooth, pencilate nuclei with pseudo stratification. So you can see that these pencilate elongated nuclei are very pseudo stratified and they maintain their basal orientation of the nucleus. So the nucleus is along that basal surface here. And you're gonna see higher nuclear to cytoplasmic ratios with little to no surface maturation. Um, there's often an abrupt transition from normal to low-grade dysplasia, and under the microscope that'll appear very obvious because you'll lose some of those uh, white uh, goblet cells or mucinous cells, and then you'll, you'll have all of a sudden it'll be much darker, more blue, and it'll just stand out to you that this could be an area of dysplasia. Um, and as would make sense in a dysplastic process, you can see prominent apoptoses because you're starting to have higher cell turnover and apoptosis is whenever a cell uh, dies, right? It's committing suicide, something's wrong with it, and it uh, removes itself from the body. So molecularly, IBD-associated dysplasia, dysplasia can show more copy number aberrations and aneuploidy than sporadic adenomas. And you can have TP53 TP mutations uh, very frequently and possibly reflecting a faster progression towards cancer. Uh, management wise, uh, again, you can remove this endoscopically or you can do a proctocolectomy. All right, next up we've got high grade dysplasia. So, in high grade dysplasia, you're going to see enlarged hyperchromatic pleomorphic nuclei. Um, often more plump than low-grade dysplasia uh, with irregular nuclear contours, prominent nucleoli, and then loss of nuclear polarity. Um, you can also have complex architecture such as cribiforming, crypt branching, and budding. So that low-grade dysplasia we can still see up here, very well behaved. And in the high-grade dysplasia image, much more disorganized, right? It looks more chaotic on a cellular level, a lot more turnover, um, replication and uh, a lot more cells um, acting aberrantly. So more worrisome process moving more towards um, adenocarcinoma. Always want to be able to recognize high-grade dysplasia. So P53 staining on, often highlights both grades. So dysplasia is going to show strong P53 staining or null type at the surface in atypical areas. And then in negative or indefinite, you're going to have weak staining at the bottom of the crypts without strong staining at the surface. And H&E is still the gold standard, so only do the staining on cases that are equivocal. So a lot of these dysplastic processes should be able to be recognized morphologically. Uh, and again, moving on, you can have non-conventional lesions and in inflammatory bowel disease such as a serrated epithelial change. And in this, you're gonna have serrations at the top and bottom of the crypts. Um, dist distorted crypt architecture, where some crypts do not reach the muscularis mucosa, unlike in a sessile serrated lesion that we talked about in the previous video. And you're gonna have normal nuclei and goblet cell rich epithelium. So there is controversial risk of colorectal carcinoma and a serrated epithelial change process. And many studies show increased risk of dysplasia and carcinoma, but again, it's slightly controversial. And what would make this a serrated epithelial change versus an SSL, again, is those crypts or some of them aren't reaching the muscularis mucosa layer. And to differentiate a hyperplastic polyp, polyp from an SSL, you want to see that dilation of the crypts down at the muscularis mucosa. Um, you can also have non-conventional dysplasia in inflammatory bowel disease. <clears throat> so you can also have non-conventional dysplasia in inflammatory bowel disease. And this may be present with conventional dysplasia in about 50% of the cases. Uh, it's more common on the left side as a polypoid mass. So here are the, some of the examples of non-conventional dysplasia. 
And the image is an example of hypermucinous dysplasia, where you have villous architecture with prominent cytoplasmic, cytoplasmic mucin. You can also have TSA-like, SSL-like, paneth cell differentiation, goblet cell deficient, and terminal epithelial differentiation. So there's all kinds of different dysplasias that we want to be on the lookout for. If a patient has been diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease, then they're often going to be screened um, regularly to look for dysplasia in the progression of cancer that we already talked about. So as pathology residents and as pathologists, it's good to be aware of these different non-conventional dysplastic subtypes so we can report them and uh, hopefully give better treatment to our patients. So what we don't want to see, but we're trying, what we're trying to prevent with adequate diagnosis early is adenocarcinoma. So adenocarcinoma is going to, be occur, going to occur when there's invasion through the basement membrane. And you're going to have infiltrating glands and cells with broad, expansive, confluent growth of glands. Adeno meaning gland, carcinoma in this place or in this instance can be referred to as invasion through the basement membrane or a type of malignancy. So it's going to be a glandular malignancy invading through the basement membrane. Uh, compared to sporadic uh, adenocarcinoma, IBD associated colorectal carcinoma is more often multifocal, a higher grade, um, advanced stage, and more often signet ring or mucinous. And I thought this was interesting when I was reviewing for this episode that you can have this unique variant of adenocarcinoma in IBD, and that's low-grade tubulo-glandular adenocarcinoma, which is shown here in the image, which is going to have very bland to medium-sized round glands that invade with little desmoplastic stroma. It's often CK7 positive and frequently has IDH1 mutations. So that's it. Thanks for listening. And if you enjoyed, like and subscribe. And I hope you have a good weekend.